So today we're going to be talking about Archaic Italy and the mythic origins of Rome. We'll begin by talking about the evidence for social stratification in Archaic Italy. So this is the period right after the Iron Age um, when we're talking about, about the end of the 8th century into the 7th century. In our last lecture, we ended by talking about the very beginnings of evidence for the emergence of a, an elite and a governing class that was distinct from the masses in a city-state or something that started to look like a city-state. And then we'll be looking at the evolution of Rome itself into a city-state, um, beginning about 1000 BC and tracing down um, the history of Rome into the 7th century. And then finally looking at the relationship of myth and history for the Romans and for us and the ways in which for the Romans they traced their origins back to um, the Trojans and to a group of Trojan exiles led by Aeneas and, um, and his, his peoples. So the elites in Italy start to emerge um, or evidence for um, some group of Romans that could be distinguished um, based on wealth, based on military prowess, and possibly based on their social functions within their own cities, um, emerge about the end of the 8th century, beginnings of the 7th. And these elite groups are family-based, first of all. Um, so Roman culture, Italian culture, um, then as now, was very much clan-based. Um, you can kind of think of um, sort of a bad example, but the mafia, um, where you know everybody is part of the family, um, whether they actually were or not um, genetically related. Well, in very early Rome and Italy, this was much the same thing. That in fact, it was a kind of clan-based system, and sometimes people would be brought into the clan. Um, and adopted in essence, um, even if they weren't genetic relatives. But this, these formed um, social groups. And originally these were the, the groups that would live sort of by themselves in a settlement. Now we get sort of multiples living together and certain what parts of these families, certain members of these families emerging as leaders. Um, the primary relationship that this distinction between um, elite and mass took was patron-client. Um, and it's in this period of the late 8th, early 7th century that we see the emergence of what is eventually going to develop in the very late Republic and early Empire into the patron-client relationship. So somebody who is in charge of looking out for someone else. And in, um, in exchange for that, the, the client, the person that's being protected, owes something to the patron. They're indebted to the patron in some way. Um, and so we start to see this, this role distinction. Um, one of the primary ways in which um, this, this distinction was maintained was by debt, um, where patrons would lend money to their clients, who were farmers in general, um, to go out, sow a, seeds, plant a crop. And if that crop didn't produce enough, um, to recoup um, their investment, then that farmer would be indebted. He would owe money to his patron. And given the, the situation in Italy, it was pretty common that crops would not produce. And so then this problem of debt became a pressing one. And we'll be talking about the role of debt in particularly the early Republic um, in a couple of lectures. But we already see it starting to emerge um, here in the, the archaic um, period. We see a distinction between elites and masses in dining practices. Um, so the elites would hold elaborate dinner parties. We see evidence of um, very finely wrought uh, dining ware um, made out of different kinds of metals, also made out of ceramics. Um, probably more interesting is the evidence for the practice of the symposium. And this was a Greek practice that has come over to Italy, probably through the colonists in the south, 
And what these were essentially were just big drinking parties. Um, so something not unlike um, something you've experienced perhaps at, shall we say, a frat party, tailgating, um, anything that involves a lot of alcohol, a lot of people thinking they're really funny when they're not, um, people cursing at each other um, in jest and so forth. There was singing, there was dancing, um, it was sometimes lewd. Um, so, you know, you guys have all probably had um, some kind of modern experience of a symposium in one form or another. Um, but this was a, an ancient Greek practice that involved, for the Greeks, only men. For the Romans, or for the Italians, um, seems to involve also um, women, which is an interesting distinction. Um, but again, this was a way that the elites would reinforce their status as elites. Um, through dining together and having drinking parties um, and would distinguish themselves from the masses in, in their city. We start to see the emergence of elaborate residences, um, things that almost resemble palaces um, or the beginnings of palaces, multi-room dwellings where clearly not all rooms are used for habitation. Um, there are rooms for other kinds of activities, including sometimes receiving your, your clients. And so, so these residences are what we use to reconstruct um, the possibility that we're now seeing kings um, and monarchies, and that these are regal palaces where a king would live. Um, it's very possible, too, though, that it's where sort of an elite family would live. So it's a little bit, we don't know exactly how they were habitated, but clearly there are people living in these cities that have a lot more wealth than others. And part of, and that shows up in the way that they live, the kinds of houses they built. Um, we also see the beginnings of the elite holding control, seizing control of various kinds of social functions, probably most importantly priesthoods. Um, so controlling the practice of religion, of, of cult worship. Um, it's not a time where we have lots of temples being built, certainly not elaborate temples, but probably do have some sorts of, of um, structures where people would go and worship um, whatever divinities the city held sacred. Um, so these were probably not the gods that you're used to studying in Greco-Roman mythology, but rather native Italic deities. But they you know, would offer sacrifices, would offer offerings of water, of grain, um, of, of metals, um, figurines, things like that. Where we see probably the most important evidence, again, for a um, social stratification, for a distinction between elite and mass, is in um, grave goods. And so it's how people were burying um, their dead, and it, where they were burying their dead, and what kinds of contexts. So not just that they were burying them with lots of material wealth, whether it was jewelry, um, pottery, weapons, whatever, but also that they were building more elaborate tombs. And in some cases, these tombs actually took the form of sort of multiple tombs put together. So a kind of family mausoleum where the expectation was that various members of this clan would be buried in this same um, structure. And these, these big sort of um, almost house-like tombs were located very frequently on roadways. So the idea here was that as people were passing by, they would look at this this tomb and they would remember the family and they would think, oh yes, that's where you know the elite, you know, the Johnsons built their tomb and bury their dead. And it would be a reminder again of the, the social distinctions of a family that could afford something like this for burying their dead versus everybody else that had to either inhumate or cremate. Um, in relatively unsophisticated term, uh, tombs. So again, funerary um, context, so g burials, um, whether they're um, in fact um, inhumations or cremations, um, and inhumation is just putting the body in the ground, um, either in a casket or simply straight in the ground, um, but sort of how people buried their dead in archaic Italy tells us quite a lot about how they lived and about sort of the, the class class distinctions that are starting to emerge. Um, we have to be a little bit careful again with this evidence. 
But it does seem like, at, at the very least, we can conclude that there's some kind of, of distinctions going on. It's also in this period, um, the Archaic period, at the end of the the seventh century, at the end of the eighth century, beginning of the seventh century, that we see evidence, material evidence for civic identity and a sense of civic identity. Um, generally, this this sense of civic identity is left behind for us in terms of public spaces within cities that are set aside for communal buildings. And we'll, we have the remnants of those communal buildings, or we can reconstruct like public squares, forums, things like that. Um, it's also the time where we start to see evidence for the construction of temples. Um, so more elaborate um, places of worship of divinities, whether Greco-Roman or local Italic divinities. So some of the Greek gods are gradually being um, brought into Italy at this point. Um, but it's where we see now not just sort of little sort of makeshift shrines, but now elaborate temples being built um, and resources being devoted to that. And oftentimes um, the resources came from elite families that would put up the money and then get credit for building these temples. Um, also, buildings for voting start to emerge. Um, the um, example on the left-hand side of your slide is a very famous one. Um, it's an Etruscan temple of Apollo, um, and this is a reconstruction. We don't have um, the, the temple itself, obviously, but this is a reconstruction of what it looked like, and you can see that it's, it's quite an elaborate construction. It dates to about the, the middle of the 6th century, but, you know, would have had sort of the, the, the recognizable temple form that we'll see throughout the Roman Republic and into the Empire. Um, the beginnings of Rome now start um, about 100 BC um, with the settlement of the Capitoline and the Palatine Hills. And in the map on the right hand side of your slide, you can find where the Capitoline and Palatine are and notice that they're very close to the Tiber River. Um, this is an accidental. Rome was very well positioned to prosper as a city. Um, not only was it on the banks of the Tiber River, but it, in fact, it has seven hills, which provide a great opportunity for defense. So it has access to water, has access to the sea, and therefore trade via the Tiber River, which was navigable, so they could send boats um, up it and down it. Um, but it also then was easy to protect. Um, the other advantage that Rome had, or the area where Rome eventually is built, is that several major tradeways um, crossed through it. So it was an important place where it was going to have a lot of contact with the outside, but it was also easy to protect and could provide for its people both food and water. Um, about 800 is when we see the appearance of cemeteries. Um, and what cemeteries tell us is that people are living there, not just passing by. Um, so if you start burying your dead, there's a sense that you plan to stay for a while. Um, so 800 is when we can start talking about permanent settlements and the very beginnings of what is eventually going to be a city. About 750, there are some, there's some evidence for the beginnings of a fortification wall, so um, a defense system. In this case, not just trenches, but actually something more elaborate and sophisticated. Um, and then about 650, so the middle of the 7th century, um, evidence for, again, sort of a communal um, identity, a sense of civic identity when the marsh that is, um, was originally found at the base of the Capitoline and Palatine Hills, so sort of from the runoff of the Tiber River, it was all this marshy land, um, this was drained um, and the sort of random hut settlements that were located there were kicked out and it was set aside as public space for what eventually becomes the Roman Forum. So when you visit Rome, this is the area that you know, you'll probably go to first of all and see all of these um, elaborate ancient buildings. Well, originally this was marshland um, and this was where sort of the very first beginnings of Rome's civic identity starts to form 
and then it prospers um, throughout the Republic and into the Empire and becomes really the space where citizens congregate and express their Romanness and their collective identity as Romans. So an important thing that we need to talk about before we move to um, the Trojan origins of Rome, um, these mythic um, origins, is the relationship between myth and history um, for us and for the Romans. These are very different um, for us and the Romans. Um, I think for most moderns, we see myth sort of in the as, as folklore, as fictional, and history as telling it how it was, as truthful. Um, for the ancient historians, they didn't make this distinction. So the sources, the written sources that were dependent on, like the Livy that you're reading, Livy didn't distinguish really between myth and history. Um, stories that people told about their origins were just as important and just as valid for Livy as any kind of documentary evidence that he might have found. Um, he wasn't writing history in the modern sense of history. Um, to some degree, a historian like Livy would work from previous histories, but often these were histories that were, again, very dependent on stories, myth, legend, um, things that were certainly not demonstrably true. Um, documents were used, but especially for the history of Rome before 500, these documents just don't exist. They don't survive for us, really, um, apart from some inscriptions. So for the most part, we're just reliant on the stories that Romans told about their ancestors for having a sense of early Roman history. Um, when ancient historians write history, they introduce anachronisms without any second thoughts about it. Um, an anachronism is just introducing something that's chronologically impossible. So for instance, talking about, um, I don't know, the, the original, um, the pilgrims watching television or something like that would be an anachronism. Um, the ancient historians also very strongly minimize outside influence. So they want to create the impression that Rome in particular just developed without being dependent on any other cultures, but also Italy. Um, in, in reality, we know from archeological evidence that Italy was very dependent on its contact with other cultures, particularly the Greeks and the Phoenicians. But when our historians tell the story, those cultures are written out of it. Um, and then finally, they are very open to the idea of inventing details or embellishing narratives. Um, they don't just invent facts or inve in invent event, uh, uh, excuse me, invent events um, out of whole cloth, but if you're telling the story of a battle or a war, it was perfectly acceptable to explain motivations however you chose. Um, it was perfectly acceptable to invent heroic deeds um, that never actually happened. So you couldn't sort of invent really big things, big actions, um, big, you, didn't, you couldn't make up a war, but you could certainly make up a lot of the details of that, how that war played out and how people, how individuals acted in it. And so again, we have to, when we're using sources like Livy, we have to read what Livy says with a grain or maybe a pound of salt. Also important is to keep in mind that our ancient historians are not aiming for truth. Um, this isn't on their radar screen at all. What they're aiming for is the glorification of Rome in particular, um, not even Italy. It's really about how Rome emerges as the dominant city in Italy and the glorification of the, the big families, of the aristocratic families at the time of writing. And so then looking at the ancestors of those aristocratic families and attributing to those ancestors all sorts of heroic and, and noble actions. Um, another aim was entertainment. It was meant to be pleasurable. So um, where you guys may feel like reading history is punishment, um, for the ancient Romans, this was literature. This was like reading you know, a gossip magazine. Um, it was meant to be fun. It was meant to be pleasurable reading. But it was also meant to instruct. So one of the, the tactics that ancient historians use is the, the model of um, the, the exemplar, so the, the noble action that is meant to be imitated. And this notion of imitation, 
was really strong. You were supposed to, as a reader, read the noble actions of your sort of previous um, Roman ancestors, whether you know they were your own ancestors or other people's, and then imitate them. Um, it was meant to inspire you to noble action and bravery, courage. Um, so far from trying to establish the truth, these were really almost propagandistic texts. Um, so when we use them to try to reconstruct what really happened, in some basic sense, we're misusing them. Now, they're all we have, so we have to use them as well as we can, but it's important to keep in mind that this isn't what they're written for. Um, it's impossible to know what actually happened. This just isn't available to us um, until we get much later in the Roman Republic. And even then, we're still very reliant on narratives um, that have particular biases. Archaeology helps, but again, sometimes archaeology requires interpretation, requires significant interpretation. And without that interpretation, the archaeology is just rocks and bones and tools. And so it's not as helpful as we might like, um, particularly for um, the archaic period and earlier. Inscriptions as well um, can help, but aren't as helpful as they could be. We just don't have enough of them. So important to keep in mind that our sources for the early history are really pretty limited. So when we're talking about the origins of Rome, we have to talk about the Trojan War. Um, this was a war that was fought um, mythically in, in, in sort of the, the history of the Greeks um, back in about 1200 BC. Um, the, the image on the left-hand side of your slide here is a painting of Troy burning. Um, so this is sort of after the Greeks snuck into the city, um, Troy, they burn Troy. Um, they have a big battle um, and burn Troy. And this is where we get, remember, the, the Trojan horse um, that the, the Greeks hide their soldiers in and, and sneak into the city. So the Trojan War is the Greeks fighting the Trojans. Um, the stories told in Homer's Iliad, so you may have read parts of that at, at some point in your life. Um, you were reading about the Trojan War. It was originally caused um, very famously by the rape of Helen, that is the, the snatching away, the kidnapping of Helen by Paris and the attempt of the Greeks to recover her um, and bring her back um, to, to them. Um, at the end of the Trojan War, after Troy has been set on fire, there are some survivors, not everyone is killed. Aeneas and a bunch of his his men, his fellow survivors, get on a boat and set sail, um, going west, looking for a new homeland. So essentially they're refugees from this horrific war, hoping to refound a second Troy somewhere um, in the west. Um, and they go through a variety of adventures trying to find this new homeland. Um, so this map shows you, um, and you can see on the, the top um, part of the slide, the big red arrow pointing to Troy shows you where Troy was um, relative to Greece, which is across the Aegean Sea, and Italy is completely off this slide. And so the Trojans really wandered a, a great distance, um, Aeneas and his men, and Virgil tells in the Aeneid, he tells the story of the Trojan wanderings before they finally make it to Italy. So in the first six books of the Aeneid, you can read about their, their misadventures as they try to find a place to establish this new homeland. Finally, Aeneas makes it to Italy. Um, he and his men have had you know, every possible misadventure, including a misguided love affair with Dido in Carthage, which we'll be talking about later in the semester. Um, but Aeneas finally sort of follows his fate and lands in Italy. Um, he reaches a city called Laurentum, um, this is not an uninhabited city. In fact, it is inhabited. It, there's a, 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 a community living there. Um, it is ruled by a king named Latinus, we're told. Um, and the image on the left-hand side of your slide shows King Latinus and his court. He's sort of holding court on his throne here. Um, but Aeneas essentially then sort of stumbles onto a you know community that already exists. This is not he's not found he's not looking for a new spot of land um, to claim as his own and create his own settlement. 
he in fact goes into an existing community of native Italians living in Laurentum. Um, it's unclear exactly how he and his men um, integrate into this community. We get two different versions of the story from Livy. So in one version, they in fact fight a war and are successful and part of the peace settlement is that Latinus offers up sort of um, the opportunity to live in this in this kingdom and rule it and to ha seals the deal as it were by giving Aeneas his daughter Lavinia to marry. Um, in another version, this is all peacefully negotiated. There is no war. And we don't, you know, Livy tells us who knows which one is really true. Um, obviously, a lot of this is probably just mythological, um, and it's just stories that Romans told themselves. Um, it's not accidental that the king's name is Latinus. That is, um, he's just the Latin king. Um, this isn't really a real name. Um, Lavinia is sort of the, one of these um, sort of women that is used to broker a relationship between two men. And we'll see this kind of, of um, relationship or use of women going throughout the, the Roman Republic. And we'll be returning to this theme um, a couple of different times, including when we talk about um, Lucretia um, later in the term. So at any rate, however it happens, Aeneas gets Lavinia and um, marries her. His men settle in Laurentum and everybody wants to live happily ever after.